It is the last episode Da-da-da. today of... We've reached the end. We have, we've reached the end. Crimes on Centre Court, episode 10. I know. It's been lovely. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you so much to everyone that has left reviews, interacted oh, yeah. with us on our social media pages. Uh, if you've told your friends, we might not know, but thank you for doing it. And yes. If, and if you haven't told your friends yet, please do. These, these episodes will stay up. They're online. They're free. Share them around. Let people know. Uh, all those listens, all those downloads, they all help us out with uh, with the Arts Council, who we're very grateful for supporting this series. Yes, thank you. Uh, and just another reminder that if you do want to see us live, we've got shows in Bath, and then we're touring the country uh, all over the UK with in crimes se- in Egypt. Yep, in September and October, and we're in Bath in August. Uh, yes, yeah, so do just check out our website. Um, there might be a few other updates as well on our social media and things. We love hanging out with you guys. Hopefully you like the work. Enjoy the final episode. Yeah, here we go. We've reached the end. It's episode 10 of the Crimes on Centre Court. A quartet of deaths, a quad of last breaths, and tennis games bravely fought. Have you figured out the killer? Have you cut through all the filler? Please let us know your thoughts on social media. Started with an old lord, now he's stiff as a board. Yes, he was corpse number one. Poor Owen the umpire, while he fell from much higher. That was his little life done. Next to me, Godfrey was Infidelia's Ingrid, strapped with her lover's jock strap. Drug pushing Ivan, perhaps not a nice man, an ugly end for the chair. Looking at the show's history, a tricky murder mystery. Who do you think made his fault dead? About a week after Lord Hugh Nose had been arrested for conspiracy to murder his father and the actual murders of Owen Owens, Ingrid Ergotson and Ivan Borodil, the Wimbledon International Invitational Tennis Tournament is restarting with a significantly reduced field. The women's side of the draw has been called off entirely due to the murders of both the favourite and the coach of the second favourite. In the men's draw, there are just four competitors remaining. Fred Digby, Helmut Hackenberg, John Sampson, who has been reinstated for logistical reasons, and, incredibly, the unfancied wildcard, Perry Pink. Wendy Weaver, the new tournament chairperson, had decided that John and Perry will play a one-set playoff to face the winner of Helmet and Digby in the final. My business partner, the bookish master of the long-winded answer, Peregrine Emsworth Pink, is one set away from the final of Wimbledon. Madness. Obviously, I was thrilled for Perry that he had the chance at sporting immortality, but given the incredibly long odds of that, I was equally happy to be back at the club because it would give me the excuse to have a poke around. Hopefully, I would put to rest some niggling doubts I had about the police's theory of the crimes on Centre Court. Welcome to the court for this special one-set playoff, Americans John Sampson and Britain's Perry Pink! Perry bounded out with a huge grin on his face, waving to the crowd with abandon, whereas Sampson stalked out with his face set. The news had leaked out amongst the players that Perry wasn't a professional, and Sampson looked a man grimly determined not to be the victim of an embarrassing loss. As they warmed up, I was joined in the players' box by Jean Sampson. We were both wearing white summer dresses, but from the neck up, she was dressed like a Hollywood star, with a huge, wide-brimmed white hat and a pair of white-rimmed sunglasses that obscured half her face. Hi there, Penny. Do you mind if I sip with you? She asked demurely. Not at all. Please sit. Thanks. The last time I'd seen Jean, she'd been telling me her husband, John, had attacked her before she headed out for dinner with Perry. Of course, it had come out later that it was in fact she who attacked him as a result of his infidelity with the now-dead Ingrid. All of which meant I wasn't exactly sure how to open the conversation. Luckily for me, Jean took the lead. I guess you're wondering who I'm rooting on today. Oh, not really my business, I'm sure. I'd say I made it everyone's business with my awful behaviour last week. Me and John have done some long, hard talking and patched things up. If he keeps it in his pants, he gets to keep it. So I'm Team USA today. Well, if you're happy, I'm happy for you both. Ladies and gentlemen, quiet please. The first game is about to start. 
Mr. Sampson won the toss and elected to return. Mr. Pink to serve. The first game was tight. Perry looked to be in control at 40-15, but Samson fought back to take it to Juice, at which point it swung from one advantage to the other three or four times before Perry finally got his angles right and held on. John held his first service game to love, and it took Perry two advantages to hold on in the third. But in the break between changing ends, Perry looked up at me directly in the eyes and smiled. His piercing blue eyes relaxed and he put down his book of sums, walked over to the baseline and bounced a few times on the balls of his feet. Mr Sampson to serve. One game to two. From that point, Perry was simply superb. He seemed to glide across the turf, making almost every shot. It wasn't like their first encounter, where he was positioning himself early in anticipation of where John would hit the ball. He was reading and reacting to what was happening in front of him, and then returning with such an array of spins, he left Sansom swinging at the air time after time. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing, but soon Perry had a match point. Out! Game, set, match, Mr Pink. Perry had done it! He was in the final, Perry Pink in the final of Wimbledon. My heart welled with pride and turned somersaults in my chest as he looked up at me, beaming. Then my heart plummeted to the very soles of my feet as I realised that if my plan for gathering evidence was to work, I would miss Perry's big moment. It would break his heart not seeing me in the player's box. I glanced over at Jean. I wonder... I'd had a chat with Jean, who agreed to help me by way of apology for lying before. I had rushed from the stands to the Wombledon gift shop and now owned a large brimmed red, white and blue striped hat and a pair of huge sunglasses with two mini union flags sticking out the side. After making my patriotic purchases and putting them on, I went to the changing rooms to congratulate Perry and wish him luck for the final. I also made sure I was seen by a good number of people saying goodbye to Jean as she left in a taxi. Of course the taxi stopped just round the corner and I handed over my headwear. Jean would pretend to be me in the player's box while I snuck off undetected to follow one final hunch. I just hoped Perry could make the match last long enough to allow me to get back before the end. I searched as quickly as I could. Aha! Here it is. I knew it. I hurried back to the club and arrived in the middle of the second set. I had to wait for Jean to spot me loitering at the entrance and come over and exchange headwear and give me her seat. How's he doing? Not as well as this morning. He lost the first set 6-1, rallied in the second to take it on a tie break, but is down 4-2 here. How did you get on? Pretty sure I've got what I needed. Thank you for helping, Jean. It was the least I could do. Being American, she gave me a huge hug, which being British, I squirmed through. I thanked her again and made my way to my seat. I squished next to the hulking frame of Helmet. Hi, Helmet. Oh, uh, so you're talking to me now, are you? What? Oh, no, before it was Jean pretending to be me. Why would Jean pretend to be you? It's a long story. Sorry you lost your match. Hi. if I had to lose, I'm glad it was to Digby. He's a great guy. I didn't know you were close. He's like my brother. Don't worry, though. I like little Perry, too. For me, today there will be no losers. That's nice. But I do think Perry is going to lose. Sorry. Great shot, Digby! Second set to Mr Digby. Six games to two. Mr Digby leads two sets to one. I had to agree with Helmet. It certainly looked like Perry's goose was cooked here. Although, looking at Digby, I wasn't sure if he was starting to limp a little. Perhaps he was still feeling the effects of his scrap with Hugh. Fourth set, Mr Pink to serve. The fourth set was exhilarating. Digby broke Perry early on, but Perry broke straight back. Perry was inspired again, reading the angles to perfection and doing just enough to get the ball back over the net and force Digby into another shot. By the time Perry edged the tie-break to force a fifth set, Digby was visibly hampered in his movement. Come on, Perry! Maybe I am wrong. Maybe the funny little man is going to do it. Right at that moment, Perry looked up at me and smiled. I took off the hat and glasses so he could see how proud I was of him, how excited I was. I had tears of joy and pride streaming down my face and I wanted to share that emotion with him. 
this charming, funny little man, as Helmet put it. Ladies and gentlemen, quiet, please. The final set is about to begin. Mr Pink to serve. I don't remember taking one single breath during the whole final set until... Game, set, match and tournament to Mr Petty Pink. I was overcome. If it hadn't been for Helmet's tree trunk arms around me, I might have fainted to the floor like a winsome heroine in a trashy romance. But it's important to say I did not faint. I composed myself and headed for the exit. If my hunch was right, I knew what was coming next. Love, 50 love, 30 love, 40 love, game, love, 50 love, 30 love, 40 love, game, love, 50 love, 30 love, 40 love, game. The game is afoot, did the shot land in, did Perry just win? That's just great, we're happy for him. But in case you forgot, whilst cheering that shot, someone has to be framed for their luck shot. Love, 50 love, 30 love, 40 love, game, love, 50 love, 30 love, 40 love, game, love, 50 love, 30 love, 40 love, game. The game is afoot. It's the last chapter, nothing comes after We've given you murders and hopefully laughter Now over to pen, to bring to an end Love, 50 love, 30 love, 40 love, game Over to Penny Please put your hands together for the interim chair of Wobbledon Tennis Club Mrs. Wendy Weaver! Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. What an incredible tournament we have witnessed today. We knew we would be crowning our first British Wimbledon champion for generations, and Fred Perry, you gave us a fantastic contest. Fred, you've been one of the great servants of British tennis and were beloved by our dearly mourned leader, Lord knows. I know he would have been smiling down on your efforts today, willing you to victory. Commiserations. Fred Digby, ladies and gentlemen. Well, look, what can one say? It's been an honour to play here at Wimbledon, and to finally make the final was a great accomplishment. But I want to give my hearty congratulations to an absolute pip of a chap, Perry Pink. Thank you, Fred. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating this year's Wimbledon International Invitational Champion, Mr Perry Pink. Blimey. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm at a loss for words, which isn't like me. It reminds me of a condition called progressive primary aphasia, actually, where you begin to actually lose your words. I, I mean, you can't remember them. They're completely... Perry. You're not quite right. Sorry. I'll end by thanking my partner, Penny Pink, for her support throughout this incredible journey. You mean the world to me, Penny girl. You really do. And you to me, Perry. Well, thank you for that educational and emotional speech there, Perry. But I'm afraid I have some bad news. Perry will not be back next year to defend his title. A combination of the financial and reputational blows that have rocked the tournament these last few weeks have left me, the sole remaining trustee, no option but to accept a bid for the club and its land. This will be the last ever Wimbledon, but at least we end with a British champion. Not so fast. Wendy Weaver, you are under arrest. Colgate had flung open the door that led from the court to the clubhouse and somehow got hold of a second microphone from the PA system. It was quite an entrance. Under arrest for what? For the murder of my father. Lord Hugh had appeared at the other end of the court. Had they choreographed this? And where were they getting the microphones from? This is an outrage. We'll discuss it at the station if you don't mind, ma'am. Colgate led Wendy away, and Hugh took centre stage in front of a, by now, utterly confused centre court crowd. Sorry for the theatre, ladies and gentlemen. Please disregard any statements made by Mrs Weaver. It was all part of a police operations which is, uh, you know, uh, concluded. <clears throat> uh, as you were. We all left the court for the relative calm of the clubhouse. Penny? Did I really just win Wimbledon? You did, Perry. Congratulations. You were wonderful. Oh, I thought so. 
I'm not exactly sure what happened after that, though. Digby raised a finger in the air and leaned towards Perry. You're not alone, old man. I can't say that I fully followed those last few moments myself. Care to enlighten us, your lordship? Oh, yeah. I think that's really rather more Miss Pink's area of expertise, uh, wouldn't you say, Penny? Thank you, Lord Hugh. So, I explained it all to the three expectant faces. As much as I've been shocked by Lord Hugh's aggression towards Digby, it didn't make sense with the theory of him as the mastermind. If he was killing people, left, right and centre, to assume control of the club on the land it sat on, he must have already known about the rumoured change to his father's will, which would have stopped him from flying into the hurt rage of a snubbed child. There was only one logical solution which tied together all of the deaths. Wendy Weaver. She had been approached like Owen to try and convince Lord Nose to sell the land. I had found the same brochure at her house when I searched for it while everyone was distracted watching the final. Initially, she worked with Owen to sway the old man, and when that failed, the pair of them started funnelling drugs into the club via Ivan Borodal, figuring if they could tarnish the reputation of the club enough, Lord Knows might concede defeat. But the plan was taking too long for Wendy, and she used the drugs to poison Lord Knows's cream. Owens didn't realise at first, but when he did, he wrote to Wendy warning her he was going to confess everything to the police, taking the fall for Lord Nose's death if, in return, Wendy called off her campaign. I found that note in our house too. Wendy decided Owen taking a fall was an easier way forward. That would likely have been the end of it had Ivan not offered Ingrid steroid help, which sent Ingrid straight to Wendy to report it. Wendy offed Ingrid and then used Ivan's own invention to tie up the loose end. The only loose end she couldn't bring herself to tie up was Wayne, who knew his mum had been up to something bad and kept prodding me and helping me find more clues. It was him who gave me the keys to Wendy's house so I could find all the evidence I'd given to Colgate, which freed Lord Hugh and led to her arrest. The three men listened to all of this. And after some brief congratulations, Digby and Perry both had the same thought. I say, so what about next year then? Are we on? Yeah. Do I get to defend my title? Both looked toward Hugh, who brushed his floppy fringe from his face with a smile. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's rather a question for the new owner and chairman. What do you say, Digby? Will you let Pink compete again next year? Owner and chairman? I say... Hugh, whatever it said in your father's will, you should keep it. You were his son. He loved you. Yeah, no, I, I, I know. The will left it all to me, actually. But you're the right man for the job. Well, the truth be told, I don't like tennis all that much, you know. I think I prefer it back in Monte Carlo. I'm going to take young Wayne with me, too. Boy needs someone to guide him through these next few years. And I like his company, truth be told. The club's yours, Fred. Gosh, well, thanks, Hugh, old chap. And that was that. I carried Perry's kit bag, now free of drugs, to the car because he had his hands full with his trophy. Isn't it stunning, Penny? It is, Perry. Very beautiful. He tore his blue eyes away from the shimmering silver trophy and looked right at me. Yes. I'd say it's probably the second most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Oh, Perry. Love, 50, love, 30, love, 40, love, game. And there you go. That's oh, it. Oh, it's quite emotional actually. A bit, I know. That bit at the end. Yeah, I liked it. Oh, little tits boy. Oh, lovely stuff. A little eye. You little eye. Oh, it's quite a big eye. <laughs> I'm always a little bit. But anyway, that is that is the end for Crimes on Centre Court. But it is not the end for Penny and Perry. No, we will be returning with them in autumn. They will be returning in autumn for the autumn podcast. Yes, the Arts Council are very uh, we're very grateful. They funded this series. They funded an autumn series, and there will be another Christmas series, which will be a daily advent calendar. So we've got those to look forward to. We hope you join us then. Please continue spreading the word. Yes, please do as much as you can. Tell tell anyone and everyone. And. Uh, We'll see you yes. sometime in the autumn. See you then. Thank you very much for listening. Take care. Bye. Bye. Crimes on Centre Court is part of Comedy Who Done It for Your Ears and Your Friends production. This series is made possible by the support of Arts Council England. It was written by Fergus Woods Dunlop with sound and music from Fred Riding and featured the voices of Fergus Woods Dunlop, Fred Riding and Heather Westwell. If you would like to learn more about the company, including dates for live theatre shows, visit newoldfriends.co.uk.